Zoom meeting again. So let's start with a roll call and then we'll do a Pledge of Allegiance. Director Muller. Here. Director Carverdale. Here. Director Michelson. Here. Vice President Feldman. Here. President Reynolds. Here. All right, Pledge of Allegiance, please. <clears throat> Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Excellent. All right. Uh, do we have any public comments that are comments that are not related to the items that are already on the agenda? All right, hearing none, uh, let's move on to the consent calendar. Are there any directors that have a comment or would like an item move, removed from the consent calendar at this time? Uh, Mr. President, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yes, Ken. I reviewed all the uh, cash flow or the accounts payable, the credit card statement, and the uh, petty cash statements, and I found them all to be in order. Excellent. Thank you, Ken. John, you had a comment. Yes, sir, Mr. Chair. I would like to make a comment and a question on uh, item G under uh, consent calendar. It would be very brief if you want to. Uh, yeah, no, good. go ahead, go ahead, please. All right, so uh, it's, it seems like uh, in our life, we're kind of the water police. So if I may ask staff a question regarding the uh, flushing program, is there any possible way during these conditions that we capture that water in a portable tank to be used for landscaping or other uses? I don't know if that's been thought about before. It, it has been thought about. This is James Durbin, Superintendent of Operations, uh, and, and discussed. It's just, it's it's a difficult logistically to do that. Okay. All right. Well, the reason I ask is the other day I did call in regarding, uh, I didn't realize there was a flush on San Benito and Miramata Street. And so I got straightened out on that. But so capturing is not an alternative then. It's just not feasible. Okay. Yeah, we, we've looked into it and that's an excellent question. Thank you. John, there is a, there is a, a company that, that filters the water and puts it back into the water system. And I've watched it, I've observed it. It's really expensive. And uh, because of the filtration that they do when they do it, um, it's really people power. So basically you're paying a fortune uh, and, and it's, it's complicated and it, it really restricts on how well you can flush your system. So there are efforts in it. And I, I myself, I know James has followed this and I've followed this pretty closely. Um, and those techniques are, are um, at this point, in my opinion, not financially viable. Thank you. I think uh, it would be, you know, uh, wise for us to be prepared for the public to make a comment, uh, and I'm sure staff. And, and that some right. utilities flush at night just for that reason <laughs> to reduce the public impact. Thank well, you. and there's less traffic. You know it, that that's another option. Ken, you had a comment. Well, I just I just wonder. You know, there are a lot of uh, companies that uh, put water into their water tank trucks, and they use it to. Uh, you know, put out onto dirt roads or they're uh, using it for hydro seeding or, you know, various purposes. I just wonder if there's any way we could coordinate with one of those trucks and blow that water into a truck instead of just out, off on the ground. It's just a question. And uh, I know that where my daughter lives in Pleasant Hill, the water companies actually uh, in some of the water that they're uh, using uh, for bypass and for uh, filtration, cleanup, and things like that. If you show up with a tank, they'll actually put that water into your tank and you can take it then and, and uh, use it for your landscape. Um, it's complicated, but you know we're looking at a situation that could get a lot worse than it currently is. 
So I think John's comment is a, a great one and question. I know you guys have more than enough to do, but might be worth a trainee. <laughs> Thank you. Option or, or a water truck. They can't be that expensive compared to a valve truck or a super truck or a, you know, truck. Well, thank you. Um, anybody else have anything else on the consent calendar? And if not, we need a, a motion to approve it. I so that we approve the consent calendar. All right, so we have a first from Bob and a second from John. Did I hear that right? Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay, Denise, roll call, please. Director Muller. Aye. Director Coverdale. Yes. Director Michelson. Yes. Vice President Feldman. Yes. President Reynolds. Yes. All right, Mary, you're on for general business. No, it's not general business. It's the drought rates. Sorry, I got the wrong page. Okay, so uh, you had you didn't have meetings attended. Oh yeah, well, how I didn't slide. Yeah. All right, let me get organized. Oh, you're totally right. I skipped over. I read it and said, no, I didn't go out to any meetings. All right. Uh, did any directors go to any meetings or do we have any directors' comments? Mm -hmm. um, so I, this is why, again, one of those weeks that it's, it happens every few months where I do have a Bosco same week as this week as, uh, as our meeting. Um, so anything I had from two months ago is a little stale, although I did get um closed session email and i can share actually the public record portion of it you know and it's just more unfortunately it's more more lawsuits um last month the uh, state board issued an emergency curtailment on the uh on the tuolumne attacking the uh, 19, uh 1914 uh distribution of water and they're even going after you know pre-1914 water rights well some of the water districts did take exception to that, and now they are suing the state, the state board. So that is all, all public record. Um, so it's just an unfortunate turn of events. It's just another layer of lawsuits. And by the time these are, are adjudicated, you know, you know, who knows? We're, we're probably, I don't think there will be a single one of us on, on this board anymore. It, that, that's for, for future, uh, future board members. But it, it's just unfortunate that, you know, it's just, all in the hands of the of the of the lawyers facing a drought you know we need a fair and equitable means to distribute water across the state and right now it's like i said it's tied up in the courts so i'm, I'm sorry to report that all right thanks thank you chris keep us posted yeah. i will anybody else Done. all right um so let's move on to general business a discussion and consideration of potential drought rates consistent with water shortage contingency plan. Okay. <laughs> so um, at the June uh, 2021 board meeting, the board adopted an updated water shortage contingency plan. And given that update, uh, staff contracted with Raptelis consultants to model drought rates. Uh, uh, based upon the district's uh, water financial plan and rate update study uh, dated from August 2020. So tonight we are joined by Sanjay Gar and Nancy Fan from Raftelis who will talk, uh, walk us through their modeling and will discuss uh, possible options for implementing drought rates. So Sanjay and Nancy, I'll turn it over to you. Good evening. Thank you, Mary. It's good to see everyone. Um, um, as Mary mentioned, my name is Sanjay Gar. Um, I'm leading the project on the study. Also behind me, um, the brains behind the analysis and study is Nancy Fan. Nancy will be also presenting some of the slides. Um, Nancy and I have worked quite a bit on many different projects on drought rates. We're just actually um, also finishing up one with Santa Cruz. Um, as we speak, and we'll be presenting that to the city council shortly. So I'm um, going to start it off. Um, and during my presentation, of course, if there's any comments or questions you have, definitely 
interrupt me because it does um, build up on top of each other, the information. So I just want to make sure if there's if I'm losing anyone. Um, so first we're going to talk about our drought rates, um, the stages, the financial implication, um, the drought recovery options that we have, what are the policies associated with that, um, and then customer impacts and then next steps. So what are drought rates? So given Prop 218 requirements, um, it's, a, it's a financial tool to recover the lost revenue due to the reduction in water use and the difference in water purchase costs. So we want to take into account both of those, the reduction in demand and how the shift in water use between your local supply with SFPUC and take those two things into account. We also want to tie it to a specific stage in the contingency plan. So as the board goes through different stages, it could invoke a drought rate. Now, if you notice, I used the word could, and that's the third bullet here, is that this creates flexibility. So by having these drought rates, it doesn't mean you have to implement them. So that's the emphasis there. It's more about having the tools in your tool belt to deal with droughts. So what we would recommend is that the board, you know, adopt some kind of drought rates. And then at each of these stages of contingency, then the board needs to decide what to do. And I'll be talking about those steps and the decision making so you can do. But this gives you flexibility because a Prop 218 requirement, as you may know, there's a 40 day, five day noticing requirement. There's an administrative record. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen beforehand. So we're just putting all the ducks in a row in some sense so that we have this flexibility. Next slide, please. So how do we do this? Um, we do it in these four steps, and we've actually written, our, I've written an article about this in the AWWA journal and spoken quite a bit about this at different um, associations. But first, we want to ask ourselves, how should water be allocated, which you determined in the contingency plan? Um, then we want to know how much this will cost us, and that's what I mentioned about the brains. Nancy modeled that and determined how much that would cost us for each of those stages. Then the next question is, how should we recover this? We'll show you the policy options associated with that and our recommendation. And then what this means to our customers and what are the impacts are, and we'll show you that. So how should we allocate water? And I'm going to turn this over to Nancy. Thanks so much, Sanjay, and good evening, Board of Directors. It's, it's nice to meet you all. Um, I'll be going over the first two steps of developing drought rates that Sanjay just outlined in the previous slide. Um, so the first question we ask is, how should water be allocated? And the answer to that is pretty straightforward. Um, water should be allocated based on the drought stages and reduction targets defined in the 2020 water shortage contingency, contingency plan. Um, the target reduction goals, which vary from stages one through six, as you can see here, is the total percent of water reduction for the entire district. Uh, that level of reduction is achieved from each of the three customer classes that the district has based on the specific percentages shown for each stage here. So those are all relative to the baseline level of water use during non-drought conditions. So for example, in stage one, single family use will be 85% of baseline use, which is equal to a 15% reduction in that class. So once we apply those reduction targets to each of the customer classes, that results in the following table of estimated water sales shown here in both CCF and in million gallons. So these estimated water sales are then used to determine a key component of the second step of our process, which is how much will each drought stage cost us? So before we jump into the numbers, we want to first look at conceptually what the potential financial ramifications of having a drought are. So during this process, we ask several questions like how much revenue will be lost because of reduction in water use? Will this have any impact on our water supply mix and consequently their costs? And will this have an impact on any of our operating costs? Through discussions with district staff, uh, we determined two ways that the district can be financially impacted due to drought. Um, the first, as Sanjay men mentioned previously, is through lost commodity revenue, which ties into the estimated water sales we saw a couple of slides ago. 
And the second is changes in water supply costs, specifically purchase water from SFPC. If I may, Mr. Chair, ask Nancy a question, please. Yeah, go for it, John. Yes, uh, ma'am, I'm interested. Uh, we're talking when we're looking at these costs, we're talking raw water, not treated water. Is that correct when you're looking at your data? Um, we do you purchase water, treated water from SFPC? No, we so, don't. No, okay, so those are the, the costs represented are what you purchase from SFPC. Okay, so it's only for raw water. And we'll have a question later on with staff regarding the cost of raw water. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So this, this slide is where we tie the concepts to the numbers. And I know that there are a lot of them right here. So I'll go through each of them step by step. So the first component we discussed is the lost commodity revenue due to the reduction in, uh, in usage in each stage. So the estimated sales are applied to the fiscal year 22 water rates. Um, so that means in stage one, if you can see um, on the first row of the second table, um, the amount of commodity revenue that the district has lost is equal to approximately $1.5 million. Mm -hmm. The second component relates to the changes in purchase water costs from SFPUC. So on the top table, you'll see the split between cheaper local supply and more expensive SFPUC water. Uh, compared to baseline conditions, local supply gets ratcheted down in stage one and is then completely depleted in stages two and beyond. Uh, so that means that even though there's a redu reduction in total water use in each inclining mm -hmm. stage, the amount of water that the district needs to purchase from SFPUC, oh, I think there's a question. Yes, is it okay to interrupt you? Sure. Oh, cool. Well, I, I just wonder if you know that we're 100% on SFPUC water right now. Do you know that? Um, are you in stage two right now or these, these estimates were provided from the uh, contingency plan. And so yeah, it's, it, it's not about what stage we're on. It's that the drought conditions have caused us to not really have much local water. So I just don't know if that's gonna cause you to readjust a little bit, but I'd, I'd like you to know that, be aware of that. Um, I, I could interrupt a little, uh, and help clarify that question. Um, Thanks, so, uh, so we're looking over, we're kind of, when we're in stage one, we're looking at being in stage one like for a whole year. And we, we did have some local water uh, earlier in the year. So we're kind of looking at a bigger picture, not, um, you know, as far as a stage and the baseline and, and the percent of each water source. Thanks, Kathleen. And in stage one, that local water supply uh, is 10% of the total, just yes. to clarify. Okay. So um, going back to the cost of SFPUC water, um, because the local supply gets stretched it down or gets totally depleted in stages two through six, um, even though that there's a reduction, you're still purchasing more water from SFPUC uh, in stages one through three due to the decrease in local supply than you would in the baseline scenario. It's only from stages four and onward uh, when the reductions are more severe um, that the purchased amount of SFPUC water is less than the baseline. Uh, you can then see that in the second row of the bottom table, uh, that represents the change in cost uh, for SFPUC water. So there's an increase in cost in the first three years and then a decrease in cost in the latter three years. Uh, and these estimates are based on the most recent SFP, SFPUC variable charge that we know. Um, but if they do decide to increase their rates higher than the amount that we use to calculate these drought impacts, then those can be passed through as well. 
once we add these two components up, the lost commodity revenue and um, the SFPUC costs, uh, we get our total drought cost recovery needs. Um, these costs in, is there a question? Nope, okay, sorry. Um, so they increase for every stage of drought um, and they result in the estimated drought cost per CCF of water at the very bottom of the table. So it's pretty immediately apparent that the drought cost per unit of water increases pretty dramatically for each subsequent stage. Um, this is because not only do the costs uh, that you need to recover increase, but also that the units of water available to spread those costs across is also decreasing in each stage. Um, so now I'm handing it back over to Sanjay to discuss the last two steps in the process. Yeah, and just to um, iterate, you know, we're hoping, you know, you, uh, you know, this does look, of course, scary, especially the stages, out stages. Um, you know, this is the, you want to have this just in case. Hopefully, you'll never have to go there, right? This is this is we don't want to go there, but you know this is this is you know stage. Um, I don't know if um, Kathleen or Mary wants to um, talk about what would be a like what kind of event would need a be a stage four, five, or six, like like in the sense of um, something catastrophic, like if um, if we lost. Um, you know, one of our, you know, our connection to SFPUC, either, you know, Pillar Cedar Lake or, or Crystal Springs or something like that. It, uh, you know, if we, basically, if we reach stage six, we we won't be able to meet um, the demand of our service area. So it's, some it, type of earthquake or maybe a fire or something, you know, so it's, it's that, that kind of severity that we're looking at. Um, yes. And it's just to have it just in case. Um, and again, you know, we'll talk a little bit about logistics, about how you do this. So now the question is, how should we recover this? Um, so we go to the next slide. And, you know, there's some people um, talk about drought rates. They talk about drought penalties. Um, sometimes there's confusion between the two. And I just want to have a clarification there. So drought rates, you know, are a financial mechanism to deal with the financial implication of a drought. It's a revenue stream needs to meet the Prop 218 Nexus requirement. There's, you know, you have to do the Prop 218 notice, administrative record. Now, drought penalties are an enforcement tool. And the way I like to metaphorically think about this is a drought penalty is like a speeding ticket. It's a violation. Um, and so and because of that, it's, you know, in some, we should think of it as a non-revenue generating, strictly punitive. We shouldn't, in, in the ideal world, if, you, if, you, if I'm not suggesting to have drought penalty, that's a controversial, topic, that's not today's discussion, but if you did do drought penalties, the goal is not to generate any revenue, is that you have it and then everyone complies. Um, and it's a violation not based on cost of service. So we're really talking about the financial tool here. So there are three options that we want to consider. One is a uniform where everyone pays a uh, commodity and actually um, Nancy just showed those rates right there. Um, we can do a uniform percentage, so it's not a uniform rate, which is a unit rate. This is a uniform percentage that would be applied on the existing commodity. So you have a tiered rate structure. So all the tiers go up at the same level, at the same um, um, pace in some sense with the uh, percentages. Or we could put on the fixed charge, um, and then it, would be, it won't be tied to usage. So we go to the next slide and it shows sort of the pros and cons with these. And so I have these different objectives here and then I have stars. And remember when you were in elementary school, if you have um, children or grandchildren, you know, more stars is better, less not so great. Um, and so, and this is my, or me and Nancy's policies, you know, you may disagree with us. Um, we don't do half stars, I joke around, but you know, easy to understand and administer that's a fixed charge. That's easy to understand and administer for staff. You just put it on and everyone's meter space on meter size would go up. Um, I would su suspect if you either did it as a commodity uniform or as a percentage of tier, um, it would be the same cost administratively. Um, from a stability and guaranteeing revenue, one of the challenges with a drought is that people cut back sometimes more than you want them to. And that's what happened in 2015. 
you know, you ask people to cut back and they cut back even further. And, and then the challenge is, is that we don't have a way to measure how much water we use at our house, right? We don't have a inside the house, a, 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 a something that tells us what we use that day. So there's some people have to sort of look at their behavior and decide, oh, okay, I'm not going to irrigate my lawn or I'm going to use um, capture water from taking a shower or doing these different things. Um, you know, they're, they're doing these things to, in order to reduce their demand of water. And so from a revenue perspective, we don't know what people are going to do on the commodity side. So if you do it as a fix, you're guaranteed to collect it. If you do it as uniform percentage or some you know, uncertainty there, um, uniform commodity, of course, is a little bit better. Now, the last three, ability to change the bill, so we can change their bill, targeting conservation or promoting affordability. As you can see, the uniform percentage does much better than the other ones. Uh, if you put on a fixed charge, you know, people are going to pay it regardless, so they can't change their bill. It doesn't do a conservation signaling and it has some challenges with affordability. And then a uniform commodity is sort of a compromise. So based on our discussion with staff, um, our recommendation is to move forward with a uniform percentage. We feel like that meets the needs of the community in the sense that we're promoting conservation. Um, people have the ability to change the bill and promotes affordability. Um, next slide, please. And so now, um, you know, there's a lot of numbers here, um, but it, that's the one thing that's, there's a couple of ugly things about this process. I'll be the first to admit that. Um, the first is the Prop 18 notice, which is these five, six stages that's going to be there and people are going to be like, what the hell is this? Um, the second thing is just the numbers. And again, we're looking, we're preparing ourselves just in case something happens. Hopefully it never happens. We'll never get to these stages, especially the higher stages. Um, but what we're showing you is the percent increase in rate that's needed in order to make sure we collect the right amount of revenue. That's the first line. Then we show the drought surcharge or the drought rates. And then the last table section of the table is the combined together. And we're adding the current rates plus the, um, the proposed rates to get the bottom table. And that's what um, customers would see if, um, for instance, if you declare the stage three drought, then tier one would be 1584, for instance. And that's what that would be there. So what does this mean to our customers? Um, so let's go to the next um, section. And, and, and one of the messagings that the key takeaway that I heard when, you know, when 2015 happened and, and we worked on a lot of drought rates, I did a lot of across the country, California, excuse me, is um, this concern by customers and, uh, and you heard this too, which is you asked me to cut back and my bill increased. It was a double whammy. And the messaging around that was horrible. We know that. And so in the ideal scenario, what we would like to be able to tell people is, please cut back and your bill stays the same, or roughly the same. And that's what we're accomplishing here. And you'll see some scenes, so let me explain that to you. So the first column, <coughs> excuse me, is um, the baseline. So someone's using seven units. Um, so their commodity, they're the fixed, the total bills, so that's under the current scenario right now. Then you ask that person to cut back by 15, so they did. Um, now they get charged the drought surcharge, um, the commodity drop because they dropped their consumption, it's the same. If you notice the bill is basically the same. I mean, you know, slightly lower, um, but it's the same. If they didn't cut back and they still stayed at seven units, then they would pay more. And so here's the example of one customer, and this is with stage one, where the bill is basically the same, even though I cut back. We go to the next one example. Here's stage two. This customer does see a slight increase. Um, again, I would argue it's basically the same bill, um, but it is you know 117 versus 120, so you know a little bit more than a three dollar increase. Um, but Again, you know, that customer um, will basically say the same bill. If they didn't cut back, of course, it does jump quite significantly um, to 150. And the next one um, stage here, we just did a couple of these, is again, you see the same scenario. Someone's asked, they're using seven units, they cut back. Now, sure, they will have to cut back. It gets more and more dramatic how they ration their water inside their house. Um, but again, the idea is, is that the service level of cost of providing that service is is still stability there, um, um, but if they don't cut back, then the bill will definitely see an increase. So we can go to the next slide, please. 
So now the options here, what to do. So as I mentioned, this follows Prop 218 requirement. This is the maximum amount um, that can be um, put on the bill. There are some uncertainties about SFPUC and what they're gonna be doing and their drought related costs and pass-throughs. So in our Prop 218 notice, we would say that any additional costs by SFPUC would be passed through on because we don't know what they're doing right now. So these drought rates may be even higher, sorry to be the bearer of bad news. But now, what does the board have? So by implementing these, the board can do a couple of things. First, um, by first adopting these, excuse me, um, then the board could decide, well, let's not implement stage three droughts, let's implement stage one drought. And by doing that, then they could say, let's use reserves or let's defer capital projects or a combination. So the board has some you know, policies, some tools, because right now, by not having these drought rates, you only have really two tools, use reserves or defer capital projects. That's most likely um, defer capital projects. But by having this, you can still keep the ship moving forward. Um, you may defer some capital projects, but some capital projects you may need to keep on moving forward with. So it creates flexibility in the system. Um, I think that's the last slide here. Um, oh, except next step, sorry about that. Um, so the board, you know, want to get your, your directions. Um, um, and if this looks good, then we want to proceed with developing the report, prepare the Prop 218 notice. Um, the, bo the board will uh, um, receive, I should say, um, the report on November 9th. Um, then on November 15th, uh, the Prop 218 notice will be mailed out and the public hearing will be on January 11th. Through the, through the chair, I have a question for. Um, go ahead, go ahead, John. Yeah, if, if the, I'll give you a softball first, and then we'll go for the hard balls later. But the, uh, have you seen any districts in the northern area move towards these next steps yet, uh, from your uh, observation of your profession? Yeah, so uh, you're talking about with this immediate drought situation, yes, or sir. in general. Yes, sir. Yeah, so two, two, two agencies right now we're working with are in the process of putting drought rates again. They've already done it before, but they're updating it. One is Alameda County Water District with um, your legal counsel work, work with Pat. Um, we have a board workshop with them. Um, they're looking at six stages. So similar to this, um, they're doing it as a uniform though, um, but they, are, um, they have a uniform rate structure too, and their board is very... Um, um, the vocal, a couple of the board members are very vocal to say about uniform rates. Say that's what they um, believe in. Um, so they're, they're doing that. Um, Santa Cruz, um, as I mentioned earlier, is also looking at this. Um, and they are, we're presenting that to city council in two weeks from now. Um, actually the same week as Alameda. Um, and they're doing it on a fixed charge. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason why Santa Cruz is doing it on a fixed charge is Santa Cruz water use, you, you may not believe this, is actually lower than your water use. Mm -hmm. You already have really low water use per capita. Your GPCD is one of the lowest. Santa Cruz is the lowest, um, so they don't have any water go, water to chase. I mean, they're you know uh, uh, drought rates are some uh, metaphorically is like chasing water molecules. Thank you. It seems like there's a a crack in the valve opening up a little bit for districts to really take serious consideration in this situation. Thank you. Other, other board members, anybody else got any questions or comments? Um, I have one comment. <clears throat> Please. Uh, on the news tonight, they were talking, I think East Bay Mud is entertaining the drought rates right now. Uh, the, they're discussing them. Um, you know, actually, Bob and I attended a meeting that we didn't report on. Uh, the finance uh, committee met with uh, Mary a couple weeks ago and discuss these three options. And we, uh, we fell in favor of the middle option. We thought that having a, a uniform uh, percentage was the most fair way to uh, spread out the drought rates if we were going to have to uh, incorporate them. So I wanted to uh, let you know that, that Bob and I discussed this at great length. And, uh, and I think Bob would concur that that, uh, that was our recommendation after that meeting. Yeah, I was just gonna uh, make the same comments. Um, we also, I think, 
felt that there's no time like the present to actually get it started. That is to go forward and create the wherewithal to actually have this in our uh, back pocket uh, and have it um, available for us if in fact we need to go here. And the uniform rate structure option two and the schedule as shown to begin working toward making this a uh, making this a uh, board action for uh, January to have it in our pockets. And also we can think about the fact that we're gonna have to start setting new rates for next year. And this would be part of the uh, package that would uh, be available as we move forward, seeing how things uh, go forward. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. We need to really get out in front of this. I already saw a rate sheet from EB Mud probably a couple months ago talking about drought rates. So we need to do this as quickly as possible. This is the future. We need to be transparent. Our customer base needs to buy into this. We're all in this together. This is just the re reality of the water situation here in California. And the sooner we educate them, the sooner we alert them to what lies out, of, you know, potentially lies out on the horizon. And we just, we hope it starts raining in October. That's theoretically when their storm door opens, fingers crossed, but we need to cover ourselves um, and be fully transparent with, with the public, start the educational process now, as was alluded to in this uh, presentation, the toughest thing to do to explain to our customers is buying less, paying more. The messaging needs to start now, and this was a really great presentation that our customers need to see and understand. The sooner the better. Thanks. And if I may, Mr. Mr. Chair, tag along with uh, Director Michelson's comment there, and, and just even for my personal information and for the board and, and the public's information, I think, do we have an exact number of what we pay for raw water? I've been asked that a number of times recently. And then also what uh, it costs us for treated water, you know, for our own treated water. So I think that would be good if we move forward on next steps, which it looks like from my personal opinion at this point, I'm definitely in support of next steps. Uh, but. I'd like to be able to get that from uh, the professional staff members, uh, someone to put that together for us or for myself anyway, if it's not too much work, but I'd sure like to know what we're paying. Because uh, I know what they're selling uh, raw water for in uh, Southern San Joaquin Valley, this uh, terrible water situation they're facing. And uh, we, we should also note that based on the agreement we have with SFUDC, that whatever others pay in the Bay Area, the other 24 or 25 districts, we are paying less in any event than they are by, I think, 10%. Is that right, Mary? Yeah, it's between nine and percentage. I, Chris, you know that. You know? Yeah, it's not nine, nine or 10%. percent they, they calculate it every year. So whatever, whatever it is, we could know it and tell people that we're still doing much better on that basis than any other agency here. And uh, we should take account of that as well. And, whatever and, we, uh, and something I did bring up in a prior meeting is our rates have been from SFPUC have been artificially low because we've tapped into the balancing account. And now we've exhausted those funds from the balancing account. So now we will, and Kathleen I'm sure has you know, better knowledge of this than, than I do, but our water rates from SFPUC are gonna be going up because we no longer have the benefit of the balancing account. Yeah, I, I mean, Mary could correct me, um, uh, but I, I think we get a, a 36 cent discount per unit of water. I, so I think we're paying $3 and about 74 cents per unit of water. Is that right, Mary? Yes, that's what we okay. pay from SFPC. That's, that's raw water, excuse me for interrupting, correct? Yeah, that's raw water. Right. Yeah. Per unit, okay. And that's the figure that we use in our calculations as well, confirming that. And Nancy, we're going to give our customers your phone number and you can explain it to them. <laughs> well, yeah, I think the question is going to be how much is a unit or how many gallons in a unit? Okay. Help me on that. That, that one's easy. 
748 gallons per cubic foot. 748, John. Um, I needed that reminder after all these years. <laughs> then, we need, then we need gallons in an acre foot because when we see if the irrigation districts pay, that's how, uh, that's how that number is going to come. Yeah, they're 334, 35,000 in an acre foot, right? Uh, we farmers do know that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know these unit things. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think it's pretty important to make sure when they hear the cost per unit that they start thinking about the cost of the Crystal Springs project the delivery system, the water treatment, the incredible length of piping that we have to service and deliver that water uh, up and down the district. I mean, the costs on top of that are phenomenal. And I think that's the more interesting cost is once we buy it at that price, what is the cost for us to deliver it treated? Uh, that's the cost that I think would be interesting to know. Good comments, guys. Yep. And, and that cost really comes down to, since we don't make a profit, that cost really comes down to what our retail price of the water is, because we're a non for we're a nonprofit government agency. So that's your answer. Um, one of the comments that that I want to make about this process is I feel it's really important that the customers understand that it costs us more money to run the system in a drought. And then I don't, I don't want the customers to feel like this is just something to, to balance the budget, but we have a, an additional cost in um, drought management, in conservation, watching the managing, looking for leaks and dealing with, with water wasters and figuring out how to do that. Um, one of the things that I, I had a question to clarify in the past, we've talked about fines if we exceed the water usage that San Francisco has has given us. Um, if I remember from past droughts, we pay a penalty clause. Is that correct, Kathleen? Yes. So um, they did not impose penalties during our last drought cycle, the 2012 to 2017, but previous droughts. Um, the severe droughts that ended up with mandatory rationing. So I think the last one was in the 19, like 91, 1990. Um, San Francisco did impose penalties that are assessed at the end of the fiscal year. If we go over our allocation that San Francisco gives us, they assess a penalty per unit and they usually, um, the way they did it last time was they did it, you know, um, a multiplication factor, like 10 times the normal rate or something like that per unit, depending. And then it's like at 10% over, at 20% over, it'd be like 20 times the, the rate. So, um, yeah, we haven't had to deal with penalties in quite a while, not since I've been here at least. Um, but this drought seems more like, it's possible um, that we will have to face uh, that drought rates from San Francisco and then on top of drought rates, um, potential penalties if we go over our allocation. So one of the questions I have for the, for the I have two questions. Uh, one would be for, I, I guess, Nancy is that, is this fund, this drought rate, that isn't to pay for theoretical penalties from San Francisco. And then therefore the question is, how does the board feel about paying if, and I, I, I'd like to start the conversation. I realize we don't have drought penalties imposed now, but I, I think it's wise for the board to have thought about it and be aware of the subject so that if it were to occur, we can approach the conversation more thoughtfully. And when I've talked to constituents, members of our, our, you know, our water users, they have, I've been surprised that they have a, a sort of a mixed bag response of, of which, which is seen split down the middle between the water district should average out the penalty clause across its all users, or the other alternative is that 
it's proportionally passed on to the users, users who exceed their restricted allocation and are using more. And so I think that's something the board should think about uh, in the event that we do get a penalty clause uh, imposed on us if we use too much water and are not able to conserve. I think President uh, Reynolds, there's the first part of your comment and question was, I wanted to confirm that penalties are not included in the rates that we showed today. Yep, okay. Yep. And I can right. see Sanjay's wheels turning in his head. <laughs> well, I mean, and you're, you're hitting it on the nail. Mm -hmm. I mean, th those are the policy discussions that need to occur. You, do you, and that, we've seen it both ways. Um, you know, you could uh, spread it out evenly. You could just isolate it. Um, I, I suspect um, Pat may have some thoughts he may want to share too. So, um, you know, but th you know, these are policies that need to be just determined. And there are some legal constraints about how you implement penalty rates that Pat will have to guide us on. Pat, is, is that something you can guide us on right now or do you need a little time to dust off the, the penalty law book? So um, I can provide a, just a general overview now. And Sanjay described this really well in his presentation. There's two different ways to approach this. One is dealing with drought rates or drought surcharges that are subject to Proposition 218. And another way is to deal with it in the context of penalties. And there are different statutes to address how you would implement this, how you would implement a penalty. Some can be applied during water shortage emergencies. Some can be applied during all times whenever there's you know, wasteful use of water that's prohibited by our ordinance. So we would need to figure out if the board as a policy matter wants to do one or the other or both and then um, we would need to work through the statutory requirements um, to be sure that we comply with those. Thank you. Okay. Um, do any other directors have any comments or questions or thoughts on this? Um, I, I think we were putting this as information only discussion. Does anybody have guidance for for the team as to, to what our thoughts are. I think my guide, my suggestion is I, I agree with the finance committee that the, um, the middle option, the uniform, the uniform percentage seems to have a, uh, a slight lead over the other option. I got a, just a quick comment, Mr. Chair, uh, a question to uh, legal counsel. Uh, do we see if serious drought continues on that this legislative body of ours in Sacramento would be looking at different legislation regarding 218? Has there been any sense of that out there in the political world? Or the um, firm on it, St. Patrick? Yeah, so there's been, over the years, there's been different legislative efforts to modify Proposition 218. It's really, it hasn't been in the context, at least that I'm aware of, hasn't been in the context of droughts or water shortage emergencies. It's been mainly in the context of affordability for low income customers and how Prop 218 can be a hurdle to try to have lower rates for low income customers. That's come up, it's been debated, it's controversial, and it kind of fizzled out a few years ago. Um, what I've heard is, and, and Kathleen may be able to shed a little more light on this, is, you know, if, if the drought continues, there's been talk about the governor maybe doing something to direct the State Water Resource Control Board to implement statewide water use restrictions like they did in 2016 or something like that. So I, I've been hearing talk of that. Um, I don't have any of the details, um, but that could be something that comes in the next couple months. Thank you, you hit the nail on the head there because uh, very concerned and the way the federal government and the state uh, California legislatures put some money out there, are they gonna continue to move more money to the 
you know, underserve the people that need it. I mean, I'm, I'm concerned about that and how far can they continue to go with uh, uh, the funding? Just my personal opinion. So the, the state is dealing with two, two separate problems. One is the affordability of water, special, especially in rural areas. Yeah. Um, and also um, just the lack of water in rural areas with wells going dry and, you know, it's mainly really small community type systems. Right. And um, so I know they're, you know, they're, they're working very hard um, on both of those issues. And water quality. Yeah, the water quality sometimes goes along both with affordability and yeah. um, uh, availability. You know, if you can't afford to treat it, you know, the contamination, like if you have nitrates or chromium or something in your well water. Thank you. Yeah. So in the meantime, I guess we're sort of in concert with, with staff moving forward on the process to uh, lead us to a January uh, approval of uh, the strut rate structure and option, correct? We don't need to vote, right? We just need to. No, no, no vote okay. needed. It's just information. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, does anybody else have a, an opinion on the three choices for how we would implement the drought rate? And is everybody okay with the concept of a drought rate? I think it, it's important to remember that we don't have to implement it, but because of the Prop 218, it's nice to have it on the books so it's a tool that's available to use if it's needed. Exactly. I, uh, I have a comment, uh, Glenn, when you're ready. Please, go ahead. Um, is, there, is there some way that we can, can adopt this policy or, you know, set it up so we can have the public hearing on it and have a, a one more item that's part of the policy, which just says, or opens the door for us to deal with penalties in the future, saying that we feel like we have the right or we have the capability of incorporating a distribution of the penalties that we might suffer from lack of conservation, but that we haven't decided that, or does that have to be fully vetted out? Um, because I think that what would be nice is is if we have some option to think about it and discuss it going forward, um, how we would distribute that. You know, again, I, I like the idea of a uniform distribution because we're kind of all in it together. And I think sometimes when you get community support, putting pressure on people who are not conserving, that that's a much more effective tool than a board, you know, passing some ordinance or having some policy to sort of force it down on people. Because I think our community has been very good at conservation in the past. And I think part of the reason is community spirit. So I just wonder if there's a way to have that be optional or to be enforced or to be decided once we experience it. That's my question. I, I, yeah, go ahead. I, I don't think uh, penalties are, are different. Again, we just want to separate them from the rates. Um, and we can't do a pass through of penalties um, in the same way. Um, you know, we can research. You know, again, penalties are um, like Sanjay, you know, said earlier, it's a. Um, it's a speeding ticket. It's a, you violated something. This is your, your uh, fine for that. Um, so it's not a means to make money. Um, although we could set aside any penalties to help, you know, offset maybe um, any penalties we would have to pay to San Francisco. But um, I just don't want to confuse the two and I don't want the public, our customers to be confused about the two um, separate kind of, they run in parallel, but they're very separate. The well, penalties I'm, I'm, not, I'm not confused about it. Mm -hmm. All I'm really wanting to do is have a pass through capacity. If for some reason we don't 
um, meet our conservation requirements in the stages and we get penalized from SFPUC. That's the only thing I am talking about. I don't want to penalize anyone mm -hmm. unless if we're receiving 10 times rates or lack of meeting the conservation effort, then I would like to have the ability to pass that through to our customers and not absorb it. Because if we don't have that capacity, then we have to make that up out of reserves. And I don't think that's appropriate. So I understand the difference. I don't, I don't want penalties, but if we incur them, I'd like to have an ability to pass them to the customer base, whether we pass it to the ones that are not conserving only or to everyone uniformly. So that, that's what I really in, intend in the question. I may not have been clear. Patrick, do, we, a, need a, do we need a 218 to do a, to, to do the uh, penalty, to pass through penalties? So this might be something we need to think about a little bit more. Yeah. Because Kathleen is correct um, that the, there are certain things that can be passed through under the Prop 218 omnibus statute. And that could be wholesale rate increases and inflationary increases. I'm not sure. I need to learn more about the San Francisco potential penalty. Um, but my guess is that it probably wouldn't fall within the pass through, that we couldn't just take that penalty and pass it through to our customers. Um, and, in, and it is different from a penalty. The penalties that I was talking about by these other statutes are to, you know, you have water use restrictions and somebody violates that and then there's a penalty for that customer who violated that. That's not what we're talking about, at least what I'm hearing here with this San Francisco um, penalty for using more water than we're allowed under the allocation. So I think we'll need to think about that a little bit more and 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 huddle as your with your staff and legal counsel and consultants um, before we can provide a response to that. Okay, thank you. I have a technical question for Sanjay. Yeah, go ahead. In our rate structure setting in the past two cycles, each for two years, you did a cost of service analysis for us. And included in that analysis, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm probably not doing this right, we built the tier structure and the cost base for the various user levels based on the higher cost of water that might come as a result of uh, cost increases from SFPUC. It was a sort of a, a built-in part of our rate structure, which would wind up costing people at the high end of use more money because of the potential of using enough to cost SFPUC to raise rates or to give us some. Uh, increases in cost because of it. I, I'm just thinking out loud. That was one of the items I thought that was in the rate of service, cost of service analysis. I have to review that again, but I, I, I believe that the higher tiers reflect more conservation and um, peaking costs and not so much um, some oh. like, yeah, the next supply. Cause you really only have two sources of supply of your local and SFPUC. Um, oh, right, sometimes, it's because of more use, right, of SFPUC. Yeah, so the, the SFPUC is, yeah, is, high, is reflected in the higher tiers, but we don't have like a third water supply, which is this um, right. another mm -hmm. source like desal or whatever, that's hypothetical source. Yeah, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, if there's no further questions, let's move on to the, then I guess I'd ask Mary, did you get, Mary and Kathleen, did you get the direction and forward motion to, to reflect on this? I, yes, we will move forward with uh, our uh, coming up with our with drought rates and uh, Sanjay and Nancy will prepare a report and we'll be looking to bring a draft 218 notice to the November uh, board meeting. Excellent, thank you. Mr. Mr. Chair, one more brief question for staff. Um, Please. This was my first time uh, with this great uh, uh, staff report tonight here with the firm. Are we on contract with the firm? Are we hourly or will there be a future contract with them? Uh, right now we have a, a, a contract with um, 
uh, ref tell us that fell within my signing. Thank you. Um, if we need to do some more, uh, you know, we will, uh, but the, the report was um, part of this. Very good. Yeah, it's the first time I've, I've seen the name, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. And I want to say thank you, Sanjay and Nancy, uh, for thank attending you. tonight. Yeah. Thanks. It was a pleasure seeing everyone. Thank I hope you. everyone stay healthy and safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you guys did a great job. Hey, Sanjay, did you get your ears lowered? My ears lowered? Yeah, for the meeting. Look like a little haircut there. I got a haircut. <laughs> I shaved just for you. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thank you, Nancy. Good job. All right. So now we're on to um, our water shortage advisory and public outreach update. Okay. Um, so this is similar to last month's report. Um, we do have a new milestone to report on. Um, Director Michelson touched on it briefly um, earlier. Um, we, the state water resource control board um, has an order for the Delta watershed, which includes the San Joaquin River watersheds um, to, have cur curtailment orders. Uh, so that means that um, agencies and individuals with pre-1914 water rights and post-1914 water rights were ordered to, to cut back on their diversions and to meet certain, um, they have to meet certain um, flows in, their, in the different rivers and tributaries going into the Delta. And, um, and as Chris mentions, um, I, quite a few uh, districts are going to sue the state over those, uh, including San Francisco, those cur curtailments on the water rights. Um, but in the meantime, San Francisco's approach is to comply with the orders. Um, and they are also going to ask for um, um, exemptions, I guess you would call it, um, to meet health and safety. And they've done an information request of Bosca and of their wholesale customers to provide them information about production and um, numbers and consumption and population to help them with their um, submittal to apply for these exemptions. So we're not sure how that's all going to work out, um, but uh, I think the takeaway is we know there's going to be cutbacks and San Francisco is, is going to uh, comply with them until told otherwise, depending on the outcome of lawsuits or settlements or whatever. Um, so that was like, that was big news in August. <laughs> um, the other thing is we, we did for outreach, we did manage to get up our, uh, a large banner yeah, on great. Main Street hanging off of our, our brick wall there. And again, I would like to thank uh, Darren, Dustin, and Mike for helping me put that uh, big sail up. <laughs> if the wind catches it wrong, it it uh, it could have done damage, but we, um, with their help, it was installed in such a way that it's safe and no, no pedestrians would be um, hurt by it if, if the wind kicks up. So uh, hopefully that helps people driving down, just reinforces the messaging about it's a drought, think twice, uh, reduce your outdoor water use. That was the intent of this, this banner. Um, and then um, if it's successful, we can do a couple more and change, change out the banner, depending on the stage we're in and the message we wanna communicate. Um, so we have seen a reduction in sales and production, but we have not reached our 15% reduction goal. Um, so that's disappointing, but you know, that it's not unusual. Sometimes it can take a while for a, our customer base to uh, get the message and keep seeing it and act on it. So, um, 
so we're still we're still out there trying to get our, our customers to um, meet that 15% uh, reduction. Um, the other thing I included um, in the staff report was the National Weather Service forecast um, with drought information. Uh, so I've been uh, listening to a lot of climatologists and meteorologists um, on webinars over the past month. Uh, and unfortunately, the three month out, you know, um, projections for our weather are do not look good. It, it's going to continue to be dry and, and warmer than normal. So um, so the so staff is considering uh, seriously going into stage two, um, probably before the end of this this year, or probably around December. Maybe going into a stage two if we do not see. I mean, even if we saw um, uh, normal rainfall, there's such a deficit, and you know, um, unless we saw really good snowpack. In the Sierra, starting early, um, I, I think we special districts in San Mateo County in developing the plan and uh, the district and district staff participated in completing multiple surveys and attending workshops from the you know, February, March period uh, through um, July. So this um, uh, the draft of the plan and is um, on the county website. You can use the link in the um, staff report, but this was a considerable amount of work for, this, for staff, and we spent 40 plus hours on uh, providing input. Uh, we did not participate um, in the 2016 plan, so this is new for us, but uh, I, we, um, anyway, we, it, we felt it was a good exercise and we were able to use some of the work that we did uh, with our OWEA um, uh, uh, risk resiliency assessment. So uh, feel free to check it out. Um, the other item I wanted to report on, um, the uh, so the State Water Resources Control Board um, recently conducted a first survey on water arrearages due to COVID. 
And so they, um, the states receive um, $985 million of federal funding, and they're tr trying to figure out how to allocate this funding across the state. Uh, and so they, they've, um, this, the legislature has tasked the State Water Resources Control Board to create a, a program to provide uh, relief for community water and wastewater systems and for unpaid bills during due to COVID. So we did get, um, we did participate in the survey. I had to get it in as of the end of last week. Uh, and with this survey, we reported basically our residential arrearages for this time frame of you know, outstanding bills we still currently have, which totaled about a little, you know, $32,000 for residential customers. Um, other, uh, other customers' uh, classes uh, weren't really included in this. It, uh, there was some commercial, but basically it was, you know, primarily geared toward residential. Um, I am not sure if we are going to get anything or not. Um, I, this was just a survey, and they're trying, uh, the state's trying to establish criteria such as lost revenue and other, um, you know, affordability uh, uh, criteria in order to allocate these funds. So we'll see, but we did our part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so any questions? <laughs> Sounds good, thank you, Mary. All right. Our next item is the superintendent report. Good evening again. Uh, fire break maintenance with the district has been continuing. We've been uh, a little cautious because the humidity is so low at this point, but we have gotten uh, the biologists at the SFPUC to complete a biological survey of the easement all the way from the Crystal Springs pump station to Cahill. So once things get a little bit wetter, mm -hmm. we're gonna we're gonna mm -hmm. attack that one. Um, valve exercising program has started. Uh, we're going to have the walks people come out on Thursday to train staff. It'll delay just due to COVID scheduling. Um, and this is kind of an interesting story. Uh, while the while district staff was trying to adjust the altitude valve at the ALS tank, um, we noticed some pressure differential in the line, and we uh, deployed some. Uh, we got some cell-based pressure transducers that we put on hydrants. And we traced it down to the, the Ritz in the way that they are filling their water tank inside the hotel. So we, uh, Darren and I went out and met the maintenance manager there and explained uh, what he needed to do. And I'm happy to say that he hired uh, Clay Valve to come out and rebuild uh, their fill valve to their tank. So it slowly opens and slowly closes. And we confirmed that the water surges at that part of town have uh, gone away. So it was, Real nice that uh, the Ritz cooperated and that the staff is using technology to uh, find and uh, eliminate problems in the system. So that's a nice success story. Um, staff has installed a new type of permanganate pump at Deniston. Uh, our permanganate is a it's a, a dry based uh, material that we mix in with water. It has a little bit of grit. So they have uh, tested out a, a new pump that's uh, less likely to get clogged and need rebuilding. And uh, we're gonna try that one out. Sean even got the vendor to give us one for free to try out. And uh, we're gonna be hopefully running that uh, as soon as it starts raining. Um, we have uh, installed some new hardware for better internet connection out there. We're testing a couple of different systems through a cell-based signal through AT&T and also Verizon. Uh, we've all learned that internet connections at the treatment plants are very important for SCADA monitoring. Um, and staff has revised uh, an operations plan for Deniston uh, per the request of DDW due to our BIN2 designation for cryptosporidium, and that will allow us to get some removal credits. Uh, we're still working with Eric Lacey's group on figuring out how we can get another half log credit for cryptosporidium removal. Um, Todd's been excellent at revising operation manuals uh, in very in very quick turnaround, and he does a great job at it. Um, obviously, we're still on Crystal Springs. Uh, we talked about Nunes. Uh, EKI has uh, got the 100% design for Grandview and the Highway 1 crossing. We have the Caltrans encroachment permit, and we are now applying for an encroachment permit with the city of Half Moon Bay for that project. And then on the HDR tank project, uh, District uh, Mary and I, we met with Verizon 
uh, with Aaron Levinson, our cell consultant, to talk about our options there at the site. And we came to the determination that we can ask them to remove their antennas from the Half Moon Bay Tank 1 site that are attached to the tank at no cost to us and have them relocate their uh, conduits that would be in the way if we replaced one and two. And since the tank three replacement would impact their building and generator, uh, we've decided to go after one and two because we can ask Verizon to get out of our way at no cost. And then perhaps when uh, they want to renew their lease, we can talk about the other tanks. So I think we, we took a, a, quite a bit of time to come to that decision, but it was an important decision in the course of action to take. And I am here if you have any questions. Thank you. That's, that's great news, James. I'm, I'm really thrilled to hear that because I that, that's new news and that's really a very positive result that's in our favor. Was that something we just were unaware of in the contract or? You know, I think it was kind of, it was teamwork. We were, we were trying to figure out how we could get the biggest uh, Half Home Bay Tank 3 replacement. And uh, from my experience, getting cell companies to move their equipment can be a real showstopper if you don't have the right contract language. And Rich Stratton in the middle of meetings said, hey, how about one and two first? And uh, we all kind of like that idea. And I think we're in a much better position to get our project done and negotiate with Verizon and not have them hang us up. So um, I think it was just everyone kind of asking questions in, in, a, in a nice team, team environment. Well, well done. Thank you. That, that's Thank you. really big. And, and we really appreciate your effort to, to get that moving. Any other questions from any other board members? All right. Well, thank you, James. Well, I've run out of items in the binder. Flip back to the front. Um, do we have anyone? Uh, do any directors have items they'd like to request for a future meeting? All right. Um, without further ado, then we'll uh, adjourn. Oh, John, you had something. You're muted. You're still muted, John. John, you got to turn the mute off. I don't know if I can turn his mute off. Turn off your mute, John. <laughs> no, I can't do it. John, you got to do it yourself. Yeah. Is that better? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's better. I thought we were scheduling an in person meeting in uh, November. Is that correct? Or October? Um, I thought I had something down. Oh, uh, 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 October 28th, a special meeting. Is that still a, a go, uh, staff? Yes. Okay, so October 28th is a future meeting. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, that's fine. I'm, I'm good. I just wanted to make sure on my calendar that was still a possibility. Very good. All right. Thank you. Good job. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank we'll you. Adjourn the <laughs> thank okay, you. Bye. Bye, Ken. Bye, everybody. Bye. We'll see, you the see you at the pumpkins. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.